Welcome to Real Coaching Radio, the podcast for coaches, by coaches. We are here to teach you how to get the most out of your clients and yourself. This is where beauty meets the beast, brains meet brawn, and science meets, well, bro science. Welcome to Real Coaching Radio. Welcome to episode 9 of the podcast. Today, me and Mark discuss how to gain maximal strength. If you are looking to gain strength and you are at any level, beginner, intermediate or advanced, have your pen and paper at the ready. We are going to talk you through how to write your program, the things you need to focus on and what actually goes into building strength. So without any further ado, let's get on with the episode. Let's talk about how to get absolutely jacked and strong. Like cocky strong. Like cocky strong, because that's a place where, like Larry Wills, he's cocky strong because he can do everything and there is nothing that he can't lift. So say I am 18 or say I've just discovered Larry Wills and I've decided that I want to become the next Larry Wills. Where do I start? What do I do? How do I get about getting stronger? What should I focus on? Uh, I actually don't know that much about who Larry Wills is. Um, so, but I'm going to guess. Larry Wills, right? This, I'll show you in a minute because this looks ridiculous. Hang on. Let me, like, yeah, let, me ins- let me Instagram him. If any of you don't know who Larry Wills is, like Instagram him now and try and find him. But before I even Instagram him, I am going to guess that. If you're 18 and a beginner, don't try and do what he's currently doing now. That's pretty much what I want to say. And I'm going to just start off by saying that I believe that he either owns a company, created a company, or is part of a company. And basically, it's called personal record or something like that. And that's because what he did about a year or two years ago was every week he was doing a PB. And that could either be like a one rep max, three rep max, an AMRAP on like a 200 kg bench or something ridiculous. And I just want you to remember, I think he did a 100 kg bench press for like 50 reps. Something crazy like that. And this bloke's just insanely strong. And I want you to, when you first see these people, just understand that there is a lot that has gone into him becoming that strong. In fairness, I have just seen him fail a 110 kilo bicep curl. So that's not that strong at all. You know, I can do at least 120. Could probably get stronger. <laughs> so strength, it's relative to who you are and where you currently are. Like always, you have to look at the situation from your point of view. So if you are watching Larry Wills and you want to be the next Larry Wills, how do we start? So I would say, by the looks of it, Larry Wheels has been training for a long time. He's genetically probably very gifted. Um, he's athletic. He's strong. So if you're new to this and you're seeing probably what he's doing or you're seeing what anybody else is doing that's got a fair amount of time training behind them, um, don't start with where they are. Like So... I think a lot of people overcomplicate this. Um, we did a podcast about gaining muscle tissue, and that was a little bit more specific to hypertrophy. The reality is, if you are new to resistance training, or still relatively new to resistance training, so somewhere between one to five years, because the chances are during those one to five years, you probably haven't been following a well-structured training program. You've probably just been going into the gym. Like, and that's fine. Um, but to get most people, most of the way, most of the time, if you are training for hypertrophy, you are going to also gain strength. If you are training for strength, there's a strong likelihood that you're going to get a little bit bigger. So, like, you, you could probably just go back and listen to the Hypertrophy podcast and make sure you're kind of doing all of that. 
because we went through the strength continuum at the start didn't we yeah and it's and it is the same thing it, we we just said it about hypertrophy you can gain muscle in every rep range same thing about strength you can literally gain strength in every single rep range yeah and i think that's where most people fail like they see this strength continuum and and it's that if they were to just read it and take it and it says you know oh for me to get stronger i need to be somewhere between one to five one to six rep ranges three to five two to five it's going to say something different everywhere you look but you know somewhere within that range of one to six reps that's where i really need to be training in order to gain strength and that's great but like we've got to We've got to look at the relative intensity there. Like if I'm training at five reps, realistically, my intensity needs to be in and around 85% of my one rep max. Now, unless you've got a good five years of solid, well-structured resistance training like behind you, you're not even going to know what your one rep max is. Probably like six seven years worth of good solid resistance training to even have otherwise all you're kind of doing is like and i've seen this before you've probably seen this before other coaches have seen this before let's say you've got a client who wants to get stronger and you say right we're going to do five five because we all know five sets of five is a good strength training program to do so we give a beginner like a five by five program and two things happen well they are going to get stronger because they're probably quite new to training but you're saying, right, we're going, to have, we're going to do five reps. You're going to need somewhere between two to three minutes rest. Because if I was to do five reps, a, a good true set of five reps, I would need a good sort of like solid three minutes recovery before I can do a next set of five at that same weight. But a beginner is nowhere near their upper limits of strength capacity. So what their quote unquote 85% is, is probably close to... 45 percent so they're after 30 seconds they're ready to go again so their lack capacity so don't if you're new to this don't even jump into five sets of five like start on three sets of 12 like you will get stronger and that's the the only time i'd ever use kind of five sets of five like that with a client is when i have my very first session with someone i may do five sets or four sets of between six to eight reps but that isn't to gain strength. That's so they can start to assess the movement. And I get four or five chances to kind of interject and say, oh, edit this about your form, edit this about your form. So if you see me doing a five by five with a client, it's not to gain strength. And that's not why I'm using it. I'm using it because if I, only, if I do three sets of eight to 12, maybe I only have three times to adjust form and to get them to focus on different things. Whereas if I do five sets, I've got five chances now. And they're only doing five reps, so they're less likely to do more damage by doing the wrong movement over a five rep period, if that makes sense. So when you do use these things, they can be used for other things, not just to build strength, but understand the use you'll get out of them when you do kind of train a beginner. It's not necessarily to build strength. It could be to just work on movement patterns and you get to edit and change that. I think like is there, is there a rep range you would suggest for beginners? Is that just 8 to 12? Or is it just something that whatever you start to feel good with, how, how would you kind of suggest? So if you are a beginner, I would say kind of like start within this, start within that 8 to 12 rep range. Because, you know, that, that rep range is sometimes called muscular fitness. Um, a muscular fitness rep range simply because if we just take this strength continuum we know that somewhere between one to six reps we're going to be gaining strength somewhere between eight to 12 reps we're going to gain hypertrophy or some muscular fitness somewhere between 12 plus we're going to gain endurance if you sit within that rep range of eight to 12 reps you are going to get a little bit of everything right so if you go up towards 12 rep 12 reps you're knocking on the door of improving muscular endurance if you go down towards eight reps you're knocking on the door of kind of like gaining a little bit of muscular strength so if you sit within that bandwidth early on you're going to increase some endurance capacities and again like for people who want to get stronger a lot of the time they that they lack and endurance they lack enough capacity because you know you're wanting to hit five reps at 85 percent by the time they get to three reps they've got zero aerobic and anaerobic capacity through their cardiovascular system that they're completely gassed so that the limiting factor to them completing rep four and five is no longer their muscle tissue their limiting factor is the fact that they can't breathe because their cardiovascular system is through the floor so 
increase your cardiovascular system, increase your capacity, increase your ability to recover faster, increase your work capacity. So stay within that bandwidth of eight to 12 reps. Increase your capacity, increase your ability to, to build strength, recover faster, so that when you start getting closer towards, you know, you start dripping down to six reps, you start dripping down to four reps. Yes, you're still gonna be gassed by the end of these sets if you're close to failure, which is gonna take you a few years to get to. However, you're going to be able to recover well enough and your cardiovascular system will also be efficient enough to carry you through those sets. So that was great. Um, that's, if I'm a beginner then, because I've done this, I've come in and I've gone, heard, I've been talking to, to the bros in the gym and I've gone, right, I want to get stronger. And I've only been training like two years and they've said, right, go five by five. Yep. Would you say that was too early? I've been training for two years. Yeah, like that's a tough question to answer because it depends what you've been doing for those two years if you've right. been going to the gym for two years and just been like you know you're already in the gym and like well what should i do today yeah then it's probably too early right if you've if in the last two years you know on day one two years ago you hired a coach who has a good understanding of what they're doing there is a possibility that by the time you're two years down the line five by five would work for you so this is where training age becomes really specific and that word it depends will come up a lot because yes, you could have been training for a while, but have you been training correctly? Have yeah. you been training properly? Following a program from the off is always a good shout. And I mean, don't get me wrong, like there is places and there is a time and a place to go in and just kind of do what you're feeling on, on a certain day. But that will limit the progress you get because a lot of times you're not tracking that. Yeah, so I was going to say, like, just if, if you are one of these people, if over the last two years, you've kind of like just been going into the gym, feeling a little bit lost, and, you know, you get there, and you're kind of, you know, you're warming up, and you're sitting on the bike warming up and going on your phone, right, what should I do today? Scrolling through Instagram, looking for ideas, whatever it might be. That doesn't mean that what you've been doing the last two years is a waste you probably could have been more productive, but it doesn't mean it was a waste because especially if you're looking to get stronger, because the reality is like you've got two years of your muscles contracting. So you've been doing something like for the simplest part, for someone who is a complete beginner and don't take this out of context, like, and I mean, complete beginner, like never set foot in a gym before. It's it, pretty much whatever they do, they're going to get stronger yeah. because it's a novel stimulus because they've literally never done any training before. Yeah. And that's why you may feel, and so I, I've had this before where I've started with a client and I've started like really, really low. Like their first session is, it, it's not intense at all. Um, we're not doing that many sets. We're not doing that many reps. We're having a lot of rest time and they're thinking like, come on, I want to be doing more. I want to be doing more. And then the next day they're like, I'm so sore. Yeah. I think that's another good point for a beginner as well in terms of um, if you're looking to get stronger. You, you know, you're going to take Larry Wills as an example again. I don't know, but I'm going to guess from looking at him and looking at some of his training for 4.5 seconds on Instagram. Um, he prob his volume is probably relatively high with some in terms of how many sets he does per muscle group. You know, he might do... 15 to 20 sets plus per muscle group in a, in a given training session whereas if you are a beginner you probably don't need any more than two to four sets per muscle group and you're probably listening to this going nah that's not enough and if you don't believe me that's fine like yeah but trust me that is all you need you want to find that perfect place where you, you, you don't have to do that much work to elicit change. You want to do the least amount of work possible to get the most out of it. And going in and overshooting, like, that's one of the things actually that bugs me about Instagram is you'll see people and like, like influencers and all that stuff putting a workout on. And, I re and they'll, they'll, they'll write down the workout in the, in the caption below. And it's like seven different exercises and it's all like four sets. 10 to 15 reps or whatever but i'm thinking that workout must have taken you like two hours so either they've just filmed one set moved on to the next exercise filmed this filmed it moved on to the next exercise and then just put that up because that's what a lot of people do or they've actually done that which means they're years down the line and you scrolling through instagram and just looking at that and going i'll do that workout for today you're probably going to go overshooting and this is probably where the 
you can you may see yourself if you haven't followed a structured plan kind of dipping in and out of how strong you feel or dipping in and out of how much muscle you feel or where your body is is looking in the mirror because you're not really following a, a, a progressive overload you're just kind of going in and going well i'm going to do this today and i've never really done 15 to 20 reps so i don't know what weight to use so i'm going to be all over the place and then you come in the next like the next week and you're on chest again and you find the next workout and it's like we're going intense as hell for like three 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 sets three reps and this bit of like confusing the muscle or whatever that you're trying to do or just kind of almost hitting and hoping it is that and it's not necessarily a progression which is something you can easily do by following a structure plan and keeping an idea of of what you're actually doing so would you say that progressive overload would be one of the key things to focus on in that beginner stage or would you just say at the moment just kind of go in and each week kind of again also regulate how do i feel and try and still each time try to get a little bit stronger but yeah i mean i would um i I would still auto regulate right so i'd still base it off session by session um but in order for you to be productive and have something tangible to be able to track i would record stuff and i would try and um i would try and progress my lifts specific definitely over time you know so you've got to make a judgment call on on the stimulus it's kind of let's say you did a set of bench press and you hit 10 reps but it was a real hard 10 reps now there's a couple of different situations we can be in if you're if you're new and depending on how well you can recover and depending on every a few other aspects in your life like sleep nutrition stress that kind of stuff um there is a possibility that you're able to come into the gym the next time you bench press and go a little bit heavier if that's not the case other things i would try and do is either could you do another rep so you're keeping the same weight but could you do another rep if you if going up weight and do or doing another rep isn't possible just stick with the weight that you're at and try and improve your movement so make it smoother make it better you know make it more synchronized just make it feel like it was easier as such if that makes sense if you're uh, would you say then if someone was going to come in focusing on the movement focusing on the skill of the movement is a very important prerequisite to strength absolutely Simply because, and this is where we start to get into some of the differences between strength and hypertrophy training. Um, And again, like, don't take this kind of like out of context. You know, I said at the beginning that if you were to train for hypertrophy and you're a beginner, you are going to gain strength. And that's true because it's a novel stimulus. Your body's going to adapt. You're going to get stronger. When it comes to building muscle tissue, you can probably afford to have a little bit more variability within what you're doing. Like, you know, you can, ha- you can have more exercises, you can increase volume, those kind of things. When it comes to gaining strength, one of the biggest differences between gaining strength and gaining muscle tissue is the fact that building strength has more neurological pathways in, in order for us to benefit from these adaptations. So what I mean by that is, you know, you're training your nervous system more than you're potentially training the muscle tissue as such as opposed to if you were looking to gain muscle tissue we're obviously looking for an increase in muscle size and volume of the the actual tissue whereas now we want a really efficient nervous system and the way to create a really efficient nervous system is and again we spoke about some of this on previous podcasts is to improve your skill so get better at that movement, ingrain the movement in into your body so that it's almost second nature. Because I can guarantee you, if so if you're a coach, you will have experienced this. If you're a trainer, you will have experienced this. But whether you recognize you experienced this or not is, is a different conversation. You're, you're going into the gym on day one, like literally day one, never been to the gym before, and you do a bench press. Like, the bar the bar is going to be all over the place like it's not going to be smooth it's not going to be in line it's just going to be wobbling around all over the place somebody may have given you some cues somebody may have given you some pointers to help you improve your technique you come back in again and you do the same thing the chances are you've forgotten what some of those pointers are you've forgotten what some of those technique points are the movement is still all over the place so and that that 
kind of pattern is going to progress because that's your nervous system learning how to do this movement like you're trying to coordinate you're trying to synchronize you're trying to improve your efficiency within that movement and that takes time so get better at the skill like some of the strongest people and some of the strongest people who are well functioning people so you know let's not probably talk about Ronnie Coleman like some of the strongest people who are well functioning people move very well you know take olympic weightlifters as an example like they move incredibly well and they're very strong for yeah. this but certainly for the size that they are that's the thing that doesn't always correlate because people think if you walk into a gym there's a huge guy he's going to be the most he's going to be the strongest which often is the case but often it's not because that technique is something that you'll see powerlifters you'll see weightlifters really working on because that's the skill it is it would you say is that's what starts to kind of get your nervous system firing in the correct way then by going in and practicing the skill is that training your nervous system to like fire yeah absolutely so there's a couple of different things when it comes to your nervous system that we need to consider first of all um one of those things would be um which one to go let's go with rate coding first because that kind of touches on what we're talking about now so in order for you to, in order for, you know, your, your muscle tissue is governed by your nervous system. So in order for you to actually get a contraction, it needs to receive signals from the nervous system anyway. So obviously all these systems kind of like link together. If that signal is strong enough and it travels down the neural pathways and reaches the muscle tissue, then a muscular contraction is going to take place. However, if you're new to movement or an exercise, then there are must, you know, these muscular, tractions, muscular contractions can still take place, but there's going to be a gap between the muscular contractions taking place. So, and this is why we see kind of like the bars wobbling around all over the place. So if I try and simplify this as much as I possibly can, and it doesn't, you know, if there's any kind of like mega science geeks listening to this, like I'm trying to explain this to general population. So, you know, we're going to really, really simplify this. So let's say, you know, your action potential is strong enough, reaches the muscle tissue, you get a contraction. In order, once you get that contraction, you get a small, finite amount of movement. You start to complete this repetition. There's going to be a delay then before you get this next muscular contraction. So obviously during this delay, like not much is going on. So this bar starts to wobble around all over the place. You then get the next muscular contraction, the bar starts to move a little bit more. And that kind of process follows until you complete a full rep. So if you can imagine in your mind what that looks like, it's like the barbell or the dumbbell is like, it's moving a little bit, it wobbles around a bit, it moves a bit, it wobbles around a bit, it moves a bit, it wobbles around a bit, until we complete this full rep. Whereas when you increase your movement efficiency, you'll also increase rate coding and we'll get what we call like a summation of force. So we'll end up eventually at a point where before a muscular contraction has even ended, the next mus muscular contraction has begun. So there's zero delay in these muscular contractions now. In fact, they start to overlap. And when they start to overlap, we get this summation of force. So there's no gap. So we start to create kind of this smooth contraction all the way through because there's no delay within these muscular contractions. And the, the better you get at the skill, the better it is for your body to understand and learn kind of this movement the, the earlier and the sooner you're going to start to increase this, this rate coding sensation um, and, and your movement will increase. Like if I was to try and like create this to a bit of analogy that you might experience on a daily basis, it's kind of, you know, if you drive to work and you've worked at the same place for the last five or six years, I would say that there's possibilities that by the time you get to work, like there's probably been days when you get there and you're just like, I actually don't even remember how I got to work. And the reason you forget that is because the, the, the roads that you take and the journey that you take to get to work, you've done it repetitively that many times that it is mega ingrained within your nervous system. So another example is like, if I asked you to, to, to put your signature down on a piece of paper, let's say you're right-handed, and you've had the same signature for the last 10 years, like you could probably do that signature blindfolded and it looks the same. And if I then said to you, right, put the pen in your left hand and now 
do your signature, you'll probably still be able to do it, but it won't look how it looks with your right hand. It won't be smooth. Like the lines will be a little bit all over the place. You know, th- that it's still ingrained in that system, but you're using the other limb now. So again, there's, there's a learning element that needs to take place. So that's one thing to consider. Just jump, in, jump on the back of that. With, when it comes to that, the driving analogy or the signature analogy, think about the first time you ever had to go anywhere. You probably were following a map. You probably were going reasonably slow so you don't get lost. You probably turn the music off because that always helps us concentrate for some reason. I was just about to say, when you're reverse parking into a parking space, everybody turns their music off. You turn off. the music off. We, we want complete silence. We want concentration. And you, you start to go through that route quite slowly. The next time you go to that same place, you may think, right, well, I kind of know my way, but I don't really know my way. So I'm going to like still, I'm going to follow a sat nav. And you still follow the sat nav and you get there. And you do that over a couple of weeks, over a couple of months, you start to get to the point like, I know my way from this part A to part B. And you're soon getting to that point where you're like, well, I can just do that now and don't even have to think about it. Well, the same thing goes for this. So if you go into the gym and you do that and you go really slow and you start to just work out how you do the movement or how you drive that route, the thing will get easier. But imagine you went, on that, you went on that journey and you tried to drive 100 miles an hour that whole way to a place you don't even know how to get to. You're probably going to get lost. You're probably going to end up having a car crash. Same goes for when you're doing this in the gym. If you go in and you try to put loads of weight on the bar or you try to kind of improve and progress probably too early and go quicker than you probably should or could, you're going to probably do some damage and not necessarily injury but you're probably going to do some damage to like the way you move you're probably going to ingrain some bad movement patterns and you're probably not going to get the most out of the exercise and learn these prerequisites and get this to fire so would would you am i right in saying don't go in like always work on form before weight weight will come once the form is there it's a lot easier to to have good form and start to like progress weight than it is to try and progress weight and then have to regress that back to then improve form. Absolutely. So form would definitely needs to come first. And what I liked what you just said in terms of like driving like a hundred mile an hour, kind of like not really knowing where you're going. Um, same within the gym in terms of, you know, Charlie said don't put too much weight on the bar, but also don't try and move too quickly. Like slow things down a little bit. Like, you know, use a little bit of tempo training that we discussed in the hypertrophy podcast. Like use some tempo training to to get better and improve your skill within these movements. Um, and kind of going off on on that same line, how kind of like all this sort of stuff links together. Um, we we can talk about like a length tension relationship because that ties into what you just said about form. And there is one other thing I want to talk about as well. Um, so, you know, let, let's, let's, cons- so a muscle has a specific length that it's at when it's, when it's strongest, you know, if a muscle is stretched too much, then it's weaker. If a muscle, so if a muscle is too long, it's weak. If a muscle is too short, it's weak. It's got this optimum point in the middle where it's at its strongest position. So with that in mind, you know, we have to remember that kind of, um, joint position will dictate muscle function. So if you're if you're performing exercises poorly and you're not in the correct positions all that's happening is you know your, your muscle is either in a bit of a shortened position so it's going to be weaker or your muscle is in a, a lengthened position but so again it's weaker and you know that's all going to depend on what position you are actually in but if you're in the wrong position it's not going to be in this optimum position where it can produce force and do what it's supposed to do so it's now having to kind of again making this as simple as possible it's now having to kind of do two things and the first thing is it's fighting to pull you back into position and and then it's also fighting to help you complete this repetition that you're trying to complete you know it's like you've got this one thing and you're giving it two jobs. And we all know that, you know, if you just as a as a full organism, as a human being, if you spread yourself too thinly, you never do any of those jobs well. So rather than giving a muscle multiple jobs in terms of, well, I'm just going to be in a poor position. So do the job of putting me in a good position or fighting to try and put me in a good position and also do the job of helping me complete this repetition. Why don't we focus on moving really, really, really well first? So that when we start to put some weight on the bar, 
we don't have to worry about moving well because we know that we move well. So the muscle can just do one job and that job will be to perform the rep and you will then be able to perform the rep with more weight. And this is the, this like strength tension relationship that Mark's talking about is when you see people who can squat a lot of weight, but only at court, only like quarter of the way down. And that's because they're probably like strong through that range, right? Whereas if you take them through a full range of motion, the weight's going to have to come down like extremely, extreme amounts. And that is because of this, this relationship that goes on. So when you do get someone, like I've had people who, when they come in and we're squatting for the first ever time, they're squatting to the height of a chair. They're squatting to the height of a box because they don't have strength in those, in these like extremities, in the, in the really stretched part or, or the really contracted part. They don't have that strength. So you yourself, when you go in, the, the reason moving slow is very good is you can start to see like, where do I find this really difficult? And how can I, where do I start to break down in form? And asking yourself these questions starts to make your training not just about like, right, I'm going to go in and I'm going to gain a load of muscle. Or I'm going to get really strong. It starts to go in and like, you have to work things out. It's a puzzle. You have to start to look at these, these things as skills and how do you learn the the best how do you get the best skill out of this and it's it i i I think about the kind of length tension relationship as like i've always used the analogy as your muscles are elastic bands right and as your arm comes down and it stretches out the the muscle the like elastic band stretches and when it comes back up it gets it gets a lot tighter and the way you can see like we all know when it's when we're kind of stretched out it can be really hard to do stuff so if you're trying to pull something from behind if you're doing like a, a chest fly or something, it's really hard at that bottom position. But like, think of your muscles when it's out in front of you and you're led down on a bench doing a dumbbell fly. The, the, the dumbbell's really light above you and you're really, tense, you're, you're really tense up there. Now, you're probably not getting the most out of that. So you'll see a lot of people just going through this middle range of motion where they're the most strongest and you're not getting, any, you're not getting the most benefits out of that. So like we said in the hypertrophy episode, always look for full range of motion and full range of motion is what your full range of motion is that current time that keeps good form full range of motion isn't an ass to grass squat with bad form full range of motion is a squat that you can keep in good form to however deep you can go yeah so like strength is gained in the range that it's trained so aim for full range but as charlie said you know you need to train at the range that you currently have available yeah and that's 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 my that's my main point of when you go in don't think about strength as you got to gain you got to gain strength just in that quarter squat position you got to gain strength throughout this whole range of motion so one other thing i would want to discuss um is also like motor unit recruitment to help us as a main driving factor to increase our strength so um, a motor unit is essentially a nerve and the fibers that it innovates. Um, you're going to have multiple motor units per muscle group, depending on the size of the muscle group, the strength of the muscle group, the, the you know, so quadriceps, for example, will have far more than biceps and those kind of things because they're just much bigger muscle groups. So when you are, I don't know, and let, let's just like keep numbers really, really easy. Like I, I'm quite like making stuff as easy as possible for people to understand rather than using like big deep science um if let's say a muscle has a hundred muscle fibers and you have 10 motor units you know you've got 10 muscle fibers per motor unit then right because you know 10 times 10 100 um let's say when you're new to exercise you might have the ability to be able to recruit something in and around the range of four to six of these motor units. So you might maybe be able to recruit 40 to 60 fibers out of this 100 that you have available. There are way more than 100, but this is just, just bear with me, stay with me. Um, as you get better, as you get more efficient, as you learn to do this the skill and you get better at the movement again you'll start to recruit 60 you'll start to recruit 70 you'll start to recruit 80 you know and let's say at the beginning you were recruiting four motor units so that's 40 muscle fibers in this analogy that we're using and then 
eight, 10 months, a year down the line, whatever, you're now recruiting eight of these motor units and you're recruiting 80 motor units. Like you just doubled the amount of muscle fibers that you are recruiting. You are going to see a massive increase in strength. However, in order for you to increase those motor units effectively, again, you're, you're, you can't just be constantly shocking the muscle all of the time. Like it needs to look, because otherwise it's just like, well, hang on, I've never done this before. So let's start again. You know, and then it's kind of like, oh, well, I've never done this before. Like, let's start again. Like, imagine you took a journey to work and for the first six, I don't even know if this is possible, but again, it's just like an, an analogy. Like for the first six months, you took a different journey every single time to work. Like, you're just constantly going to be on your map. Whereas if you do one journey for the first two weeks, the chances are by the time you get into week three, you're starting to understand how to get there without a map now. By the time you get six months in, you can just stick your headphones in and away you go. Like think of muscles almost working in a similar fashion, if you like. So don't constantly ask your muscle to be guessing how to do stuff. Teach it how to do these fundamental exercises really, really, really well. And then you can start putting some weight on the bar. And you'll see that when you start to do different exercises in the gym. If you kind of if you've been following the same, say, six, eight, ten exercises every single time you come into the gym, and then one week you add in, like, say you've just been doing bilateral work, you've just been squatting this whole time, and you come in and you get asked to do a Bulgarian split squat, you'll be all over the place. Your body will be, because you've got to learn how to control yourself in, in that way, and that's the difference is, like, tr again, you, you, if, you don't use, if you don't use it, you lose it. You have to train yourself in like multiple different ways but have a structure on how you're going to do that so like again that's why i, I program in blocks you're going to do the same pretty much exercise the same main exercise for like four or five weeks so you can start to get like get your skill improve your skill and ingrain that pattern of how you move throughout that yeah and then probably one other thing to consider um would be like golgi tendon organ inhibition so Golgi tendons like sit within the, the tenderness muscle, the tendon ends of a muscle, sorry, as kind of like the name suggests. And they register any form of tension going into the muscle tissue. And if there's too much tension that goes into the muscle tissue, um, it starts to kind of inhibit contractions. So it prevents contractions taking place just as a bit of a safety mechanism, really. So you don't tear muscle tissue, you don't become injured, and it stops you having you know too much load compared to the tissue tolerance. Whereas the more we expose people to load and again like you're just going to have to do this over time so again think about progressive overload we can start to desensitize some of those golgi tendon organs so they start to understand and they start to learn and register that you're constantly putting like again using a simple analogy constantly putting more tension into the muscle tissue and they you know it's kind of a bit like um if you take drugs you know, like if you take drugs and you start with, I don't literally don't know anything about drugs. Um, but like, you know, you start to take, I don't know, some form of drug or whatever, and then you become a bit of an addict. And then six months down the line, you need to like quadruple your dose before you get a high off this thing or whatever it is. You know, it's the same with kind of these Golgi tendon organs. Like the more you do it, that they'll be obviously they're still going to be working because they're still there as a defense mechanism but they'll be desensitized slightly so that it allows you to push a little bit more weight um and there's probably going to be a mental aspect that's going to come into that as well you know this as you start to get close to your upper limits of your capacity then there's a bit of a head game you know it gets heavy it gets hard um there's there's a big mental side of this game as well as just the physiological things that we've been speaking about so far so we now understand how how our muscles work basically how we how we go into getting stronger we start to understand kind of motor unit recruitment and that rate coding that we talked about like you may feel a bit jittery when you're doing a bench press and you may feel like you can't actually press the bar and th that is because of that rate coding and then you may not feel as strong when you first start but six months down the line you'll be 10 times stronger and it's just that consistency and breaking through that first barrier so I'm a beginner. I've come in and I've, I've basically done everything you said. I've worked on the skill and I've been training the, these big compound lifts because 
would you say that there are certain certain exercises that I should train as well like would you say the compound compound movements are probably the, the best way to start or at least prioritize them at the start of my training yeah so you know start with bang for buck you know essentially if you think about progressive overload the exercise that allows you to move the most amount of weight yeah whether and, and at this moment in time for some people again like a bit of a caveat to some of the stuff we've been talking about um you know, we always talk about barbells and those kind of things. Like if people lack time, as an example, to get stronger, whether they're trying to get stronger, let's say you're training, let's say you're a runner or you're training a runner and they've got a 10K in six months time and you know that their legs need to be a bit stronger because it's going to be beneficial for their running. And you're like, well, I could barbell back squat with them, but it's going to take me four months to teach them how to do this because I only see them once a week. So it's going to take me four months to teach them, which, you know, realistically, it's going to take me five months to start putting a bit of weight on the bar properly. So it then gives me a month before the race. So they're not going to get very strong at all. They're going to get stronger. But is that strength going to have a benefit to what it is they're trying to achieve? Whereas let's take away some of like the skill element of that and just stick them on a leg press, yeah. like and put some weight on it. So, yeah, at this moment in time, if you're a beginner, use exercises that allows you to at the moment move the most amount of weight basically you need to look at it as if you like for example the reason people say like like no one's really impressed with a leg like your leg press doesn't carry over to how you squat because of that skill element and that skill element is like something that you you make the decision on basically when you first go in you could you can go in and you can in it like if you're if you're not a runner, for example, and you're just someone who wants to get stronger, you've got no time limit on this. Make your program a mix of like a mix of all of these, a mix of free weight exercises and a mix of like machine exercises, basically. So, is there? I've come in. I'm focused on these compound lifts. I'm a beginner. I've been training for like two years now. I've been progressively overloaded, and I feel like I can't get stronger. I feel like I can't gain any more muscle. I feel like I cannot progress. I've hit a plateau. What the hell do I do now? Yeah, so you probably want to start thinking about jumping on some sort of program, um, whether that be a 5x5 five five program, like a 531 program. Like, there, there are plenty out there with a bit of a Google search, and you'll find them. They kind of all work off similar principles in terms of what they're trying to achieve. But essentially, this is where some of the differences we start to see with like strength training and hypertrophy training. So you're cert- you know, a lot of strength training programs are done kind of like off percentages. Um, so they'll work around percentages quite a lot. And you might go through some different phases. So you might start to really start to periodize some of your work now. So um, as an example, like in week one, you might start to do a bit of an accumulation phase. So that would just be like higher volume, like, which is then going to be lower weight kind of work, you know, your per exercise or certainly the big compound based exercises, you might be performing like 50, 60 reps, you know, five, five sets of 10 as an example, those kind of things. And then you can start to move into um, a bit of like an intensification phase. So now your volume is starting to come down a little bit and your your weight is starting to go up. So you're starting to go a little bit closer to what you can kind of lift. And then in week three, there might be a bit of a realization phase where you're pretty much maxing out on what it is that you can do. So your volume is going to get stripped right out now. So as an example, in week one, this accumulation phase per exercise, and this isn't, you know, per every every exercise in the gym this is per those big key exercises so squat deadlift as an example you might have done across five sets you may have done 50 reps whereas by the time you're getting to this sort of like realization phase in your first three sets you're doing maybe i don't know six six reps seven reps 10 at absolute most as an example set one you might do five reps set two you might do three reps set set three you might do a single and then on set four with that weight you're maxing out for the most amount of reps that you have and then on the fourth week you have a bit of a deload week and then you kind of do it all again but the percentages change the rep ranges change and those kind of things when you say deload week then how how do i go about going for a deload week because that makes perfect sense to me the training part, I'm, but surely if I take a deal a week, I'm going to go backwards. I'm not going to get as strong. Yeah. 
So this is what most people think, which is like funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the biggest difference between one of the biggest differences between um, strength and hypertrophy training is the recovery capabilities, if you like. So with hypertrophy training, you can afford to not necessarily be fully recovered because you're driving fatigue into the muscle tissue and that's going to create muscle damage. That's potentially one of the driving factors to building muscle tissue. Whereas if you're looking to gain strength, then we want predominantly neural adaptations now because based on some of the stuff we've already spoken about, we know that, that we need that nervous system firing really well. Pretty much what's going to limit your ability to get stronger is how well you can recover. So recovery is now incredibly important. So all of these adaptations are going to take place during this recovery period. So for, in order for you to get stronger, recovery now becomes a, an incredibly important aspect. So that deload week is because otherwise you're not going to be able to go in and just go heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier week after week after week after week. Otherwise we would see like insanely strong people. Like it just doesn't work that way. You need to have this recovery system in place so that you can gain those adaptations, your system can recover and then you can start to move forward through your next phase. So when I go in on my recovery week then, Am I, what, what do I do? Do I go in and still do the same exercises, but would I lower the weight down? Would I lower the sets, lower the reps and kind of just go like three sets of 10 on the main movements and work on the skill? Yeah, so I mean, you can, I mean, 10, 10 might, 10 is probably not even poss- even needed really. You might do like three sets of five, at maybe 60 to 65%. Whereas if you think we spoke about five, for it to be a challenging weight we're talking around kind of like 80 to 85 percent you know close to that 85 percent and we're now asking you to do five uh probably 65 percent so the, the weight is you know the, the intensity has come down now but again it's exactly that the the aim is you're just trying to main you or you're you're definitely trying to maintain the skill if not get better at the skill like we can always get better at it yeah so that's the you've you've kind of got an, an outline there of how you go around it. You 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 again you can get a program, you can find one on the internet, or you can speak to a coach and like get get one that's properly tailor made for you, and and to like suit your goals. But that dealer week is as important as everything else because I think like when when powerlifters kind of come up to a meet, they're basically getting ready to slingshot into it, aren't they? Yeah, and and I would say one thing for people to consider. Um, if they do kind of get like a five by five program or any other template offline, and there are literally hundreds out there, um, it will all be based off percentage work. Again, that you need to you need to be honest with yourself because that percentage work needs to be realistic. So again, you need to have had a good amount of training experience for those percentages to really mean anything to you. Um, if you're coming across from kind of a bit more of a hypertrophy background as well, when training to muscular failure is probably um, a bit more popularized, if you like, when, you come, when it comes to gaining strength, not every session needs to be trained to muscular failure. Again, like we're trying to train the nervous system to be really, really efficient. And that doesn't, you know, the only real time on that that four week period that I just described, the only real time you're going to true muscular failure is in the last set on week three. Everything else is done to definitely hard working sets, but you don't need to go to muscular failure every single time. So this is where you'll see the difference between like kind of your your CNS being fatigued and your muscles being fatigued. That if you're always someone who chases the pump and hypertrophies the way you want to train or has been training and you decide to go for a strength phase, the, get yourself in that head game that you are not going to walk out of the gym with a pump. You may feel that the difference is, is that when you walk out of a gym with a pump, when you're going through a hypertrophy phase, within 45 minutes it's gone and you feel like kind of half the size that you did when you're walking around town or whatever you were doing. So the difference is when you do a strength phase, you're going to feel solid a lot more of the time. You may not have that pumped up feeling, but you are going to feel a lot, a lot more solid than, than, you, than you would when you go for a hypertrophy phase. So 
the only other thing I can think about is when we spoke about auto regulating the other week. When it comes to a strength phase, how I when I'm a beginner, obviously I just may not be able to move that amount of weight, like because I just can't recruit that much, right? So I can go in and it may be really difficult for me to do six reps, but within 30 seconds I could go again. Whereas when you get kind of a further along down the line, that rest time would that get longer? Would I start to almost auto regulate that? Is there a guide that I should follow? A yeah. minimum, basically. Um, I would, you know, if you're, in, let, let's say we're six reps plus. Sorry, six reps left or below. Um, your rest wants to be somewhere between two to five minutes if you're close to your capacity you know and use that as a guide like if you're at six reps you could probably go two to two and a half minutes if you're dropping down to threes you're going down to doubles you might want to push that closer towards the five minute mark just because the energy system being used is very different and it needs a longer time to recover and we need full replenishment of that um again your nervous system needs a little bit of time to recover so we just need our systems to be recovered whereas again with hypertrophy training we're not necessarily looking for full recovery in the system because we're trying to drive fatigue and to a certain extent trying to drive a growth hormone uh, response through the increase in volume whereas with strength training like it's a very different response that we're looking for and we do want full recovery. Um, but yeah, if you are a beginner and you're doing six reps and you feel like after 30 seconds, you're ready to go again, like you're nowhere near what your six reps should be, but that is exactly where you should be because you are a beginner. So if you're a beginner, jump to 12 reps um, and get more volume in there and spend time there. As you start working your way down the, down the rep scheme, yeah, your recovery period is going to increase. Yeah. I and mean, auto-regulate that based on how you feel that day and if you need more time. Like some people genuinely, like I, I know, I think that Australian strength coach, he has like 10 minutes between like his like top sets. Yeah, but again, like look how close he is to pretty much his true right. full potential. Like the closer you get to... to that genetic potential. Yeah, right? the closer you get to those end limits, the more recovery you're yeah. you're gonna need and it's the same as it's the same as like you see like formula one cars driving around a track like they have to come in for pit stops and this recovery week is the same thing you have to come the recovery week and the rest periods there are these little pit stops that you need because you need to give yourself that ability to to be able to go back out on the track and, and to go like your full max because you don't want to go into like your next set still kind of like half fatigued and not really feeling it so yes you may get a prescribed rest period of between that two to five minutes but if on that day you're feeling absolutely hanging and you need a little bit longer that's fine that is completely fine you just need to you you need to start to work that out yourself and what you work best with because like and, and that's why training with people can sometimes be an issue because you may all have different like ways of doing it you may all have different auto regulations someone may want to go in after two minutes but you may need that extra five minutes and that is okay like that is genuinely fine you just need to work out what works best for you and try not to get confused between hypertrophy and strength when it comes to the goals you're trying to get out of it so try not to get confused with the fact that actually this time i go in i'm trying to build some strength and trying to get stronger so i don't really want to be feeling like muscle fatigue i don't really want to be like pushing to failure on every single thing i do because you know that's not what's going to benefit you and try not to get confused or try not to like mix the goals up because I see that happen quite a bit in what I guess what they call power building now yeah I that that is that is without a doubt the single biggest mistake I see people doing when they're trying to get stronger they they want to do too much they want to do too many reps they want to do too many sets they want to do too much volume and all that happens is over a period of time you cannot recover from it that's what just happened to me literally just what it's just what happened to me yeah. and i've just realized that i'm trying to do fuck like four or five different things at once and it's just you you need to have a focus and i've been training for years and i still fall into the trap because of ego because of whatever it is that drives us to do the things we know we shouldn't but you do fall into these traps and you just need to be careful or like just be very aware of, like be honest with yourself like yeah. what do you want to achieve 
And people start to chase the pump because, like, it feels good. Right. And right? You know, that's why people do it. It's a psychological thing, yeah. man. Like, that's why, Ar- yeah. like, Arnie said it on Pump and Iron. Yeah. You, yeah. It is a psychological thing. Yeah. But, if you know, if your aim is to get stronger, like, and truly get stronger, then, yeah, you gotta be you got to be a little bit more strict with yourself um, and not fall into that trap of just chasing the pump. Because if getting you, you will get a bit stronger but the closer you get to the strongest you can get the more these things start to matter as we said at the beginning you know hypertrophy training if you're looking to get stronger hypertrophy training for most people most of the time will get the most of the way it's okay so when we get to that point now what do we do yeah and and realize where you are on that journey as well because i think i I've jumped into strength phases way too early in my in, in like my training, and like understand like how your training has been as well. Because if your training has not been that good for the past six months or whatever, then obviously you're gonna have to like go into a strength phase because you're trying to get back into it. It's probably not the best thing to do. Like have a progression on the training that you do. So that is everything, I guess, on building strength. Yeah. Again, like similar with the hypertrophy stuff. Like we haven't touched on. We haven't touched on nutrition. We haven't touched on recovery strategies. We haven't touched on sleep or anything like that. Um, Purely and training. And obviously, yeah. And obviously, they or you know, you can go and flog yourself in the gym, but like, if your sleep is terrible and your nutrition is terrible, like again, you still ain't going to get stronger. So there are the reason I think like health and fitness is so big is because there's so much that goes into it, and you have different camps that fall into different like things. You have people like powerlifting way of training bodybuilding style of training crossfit or you get people that kind of hype harp on about nutrition and or you get like the wellness people and there's like just so much that goes into it but that's because there are a lot of things that you can get benefit out of and it's just working out for yourself because you can hire a coach you can hire someone to do your nutrition but you ultimately it's your body and you can start to learn what feels best for you same as when you're doing trying to build strength if you go in and you're gonna want to go for a strength phase but you don't feel like you're ready then then don't do it if you feel like you should be at higher reps then then stay there for a bit longer if you feel like you need more rest time then have more rest time you can start to learn how your body works and it is just like it is ten thousand hours you become a master at something right so exercise and, and and training is exactly the same because all of these things are skills so think about like strength it is difficult there is going to be what i like to call pain when you do go for a strength period because it's going to be hard the the mental aspect of a strength period and trying to get stronger is hard i find like strength in itself really frustrating yeah i mean like the neural fatigue that you get from it like when you're kind of i remember when i when i went for a pb deadlift um and i was just like right i'm gonna go in i'm gonna hit this deadlift and then i'm gonna do like some of that accessory stuff afterwards um you know and do a full session effectively um i did like some warm-up sets i hit my pb on a deadlift and then like that was me for like three days yeah yeah you know, the amount of neural fatigue you know and you see that yeah. the, the neural fatigue, like, and the, the, the reason your central nervous system plays a, such a big role is because when we say your true potential, like there are stories of like mums lifting cars off of their children when like there's been an accident and they, they recruit all of this strength to lift like a ton car or whatever. And that is because we do have it inside of us. We just have to learn how to recruit it. We have to learn how to get there. So if you do want to get stronger, start from the beginning work your way through everything we've spoke about take the points into consideration like if you've just listened to this podcast and you're like i'm still lost go back through and make notes as you go through and work out how you're going to plan your 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 journey going forward when it comes to building strength it is going to be hard there is going to be pain and there is going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of times where it's frustrating just remember you don't always have to get better you don't always have to get stronger you may feel like you're going backwards some days and that's always a good time to realize that you probably do need that recovery week that we're talking about. So if there's anything else, Mark? Uh, the only other thing based off what you've just said is just like, be patient. Yes. And we will leave you with that. Be patient with this journey. You will get there. You will get stronger. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you on the next one. Hopefully that has given you a blueprint. Hopefully that has given you some guidance on what you need to do if you want to gain strength. I think one of the biggest things we need to talk about here is this journey is a long journey. If you're a natural athlete, if you're someone who isn't getting help from anabolic steroids or anything like that, then this journey could be really frustrating. And the little things, they do, they do matter. One of the things I'd like to highlight again is that Recovery can be really important in this as well. Sometimes we have the mentality that more is always better. But when it comes to strength, if you're not recovered enough, then you're not going to get the most out of your session. If intensity is high, recovery best be high as well. So have a focus on your whole training plan, your nutrition, have focus on your recovery and what you're going to be doing each time you enter the gym. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the podcast. If you do want to find either myself or Mark, you can head to our Instagram pages at Mark Origin Series, or if you want to find me, it's at Charlie RJ Hacker. You can find educational content at Origin underscore Series or at Hack the Body, Hack the Mind. And that is where you will basically get educational content from us. We talk about things like strength, tempo training, all sorts of different topics, to be honest with you. But if you do want to connect with us, please, please reach out. Real Coaching Radio also has an Instagram page, so you can find us there. We basically just post clips. And if you want any questions or want to ask any questions, you can either send us a message there or email in info at realcoachingradio.co.uk. Once again, strength is going to take time. So be patient, be smart, and be prepared. Thank you very much for tuning in. This has been Real Coaching Radio.